everyone and welcome to yet another session of integrated session uh, for next and neat pg 2021 and today we have our anesthesia faculty dr ajay yadav sir welcome uh, sir to this hello. integrated session hello thank you dr niya yes so uh, we will be taking the expert opinion of the sir um, in the anesthesia as you know we have actually you know integrated ophthalmology with the maximum of the subjects and anesthesia was missing so i requested sir that let's have a session because obviously the anesthesia remains important part and that also needs to be integrated so let's get started uh anesthesia as you every uh, one uh, of you know that it's a reversible loss of a feeling or a sensation and especially we are concerned with the loss of pain sensations every time we have any surgery and even when we do not have surgery uh, let's talk about the normal delivery also pain is always a matter of uh, you know uh, stress and uh, anesthesia is greatly greatly required to reduce that stress and painful sensations so um, if you start from the history itself uh, we go to the carl koller who was born on december 3 and uh, he died in um, 1944 he was from austria and he is a uh, very much known for the local anesthetic work in the field of ophthalmology right so uh, then there was another person hanman jacob he was also known for the retrobulbar block and uh, there is one more person who deserves a special mention that is your van lint who achieved the orbicularis uh, echinacea by the local injection and even today we call it as the van lint block we will be talking about it in the facial block all right now uh, coming to the general anesthesia those the sir will be taking your general anesthesia part it was first used by morton of boston us and uh, he actually used the ether right now i am coming to the ocular anesthesia ocular anesthesia is uh, of two types we have general anesthesia and we have local anesthesia so before i start with the local anesthesia and we will be discussing the different kinds of local anesthesia i will first request sir to uh, tell us about the general anesthesia and uh, the drugs which are used here so sir please take up the general anesthesia part sure sure dr niya can share the screen yes sir okay so can i uh... sir share the screen share screen button aapko sir click karna hoga just a second okay ji host disabled participant screen sharing host princey enable no sir you can share now aap karke dekhiyega sir now it's okay yes sir Can I start now? Is clear, uh, Rinci, Doctor Nia? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good to go, sir. Yes, sir. Good to go. Okay, fine. So, uh, welcome, students. So, I hope this session will be very useful, and it's a great effort of Doctor Nia to organize such integrated sessions. So, thank you, Doctor Nia, for organizing such a a uh, nice integrated session which will be very helpful for the students thank you sir so as far as uh, eye surgeries are concerned from hemodynamic point of view uh, this eye surgeries are actually low risk surgeries because we don't expect much hemodynamic fluctuations however they become high risk because uh, <clears throat> patients are at the extreme of the age either they are uh, too young pediatric patients or too old geriatric patients Uh, so therefore uh, pre operative evaluation become very very important for these patients mainly i told you because of the advanced age and advanced age means uh, life come with package of diseases 
and uh, so these patients majority of them will be hypertensive diabetics many of them uh, will be having ischemic heart disease so detailed history is very important to find the medical status of the patient so that accordingly we can categorize them and uh, so investigations again uh, as a routine uh, practice investigations are based on medical conditions like, like you know there was uh, a trend and that trend unfortunately still followed in many institutes that we undergo battery of tests for the patients who are undergoing uh, <clears throat> surgery but that is not required each investigation should be justified and one very important point i like to add here, add here is that no patient is fit for general anesthesia if he or she is not fit for general anesthesia so consider that even if the patient is for general anesthesia he or she may require general anesthesia any time so evaluate from that point of view because this is a common controversy we encounter uh, from <clears throat> surgeon side also sir it will be under topical so no problem but if the ga is required then so you have to evaluate patients from general anesthesia point of view and majority of these eye surgeries they are on day care basis and uh, for day care we follow same day care guidelines that uh, asa and you know that asa category is to assess the risk so we'll not go in all those details so asa grade 1 and 2 we do take 3 if they have controlled disease we do take but if they are uncontrolled we won't take them for day care surgery and another thing i like to add is and that is a recent addition that super morbid patient should also not be taken for day care surgery but if if their bmi is more than 50 fasting very important i told you prepare every patient for general anesthesia so we need full fasting that again becomes controversial point sometimes we think that the patient is in uh, uh, regional anesthesia or topical anesthesia and we give uh, feed but if that patient required ga you will not leave surgery in between so full fasting is must and full fasting guidelines you all know that it is 6 to 8 hours for solid water can be given up to 2 hours and for babies uh, on breast milk breast milk can be given up to 4 hours so full fasting guidelines are needed regarding medications it's a big list but i'll just be covering the common medications like uh, i told you majority patients will be hypertension hypertensive diabetic or ischemic heart disease so all antihypertensives we do, do continue except we omit uh, ac inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers which are stopped a day before surgery this again had been a, a topic of great debate and uh, still you will find lot of guidelines like american guidelines are different uk guidelines are different australian are different and indian guidelines you know there are no guidelines so they are also different so uh, but recent the most uh, you can say favorable school of thought is that we should stop them a day before surgery now the most i'll say uh, a debatable topic acceptable blood pressure because many time this patient when they are coming to ot they may not be having normal blood pressure their bp may be high now what is the cut off normally if and this is again the recent uh, american <clears throat> cardiology society guidelines along with the international society guidelines of anesthesia that if bp is 170 uh, systolic or 110 diastolic absolutely patient will not be taken for surgery below this it depends case to case like for example if it's a cataract surgery and patient is only hypertensive not ischemic heart disease or no other medical disease then i may accept 160 or 105 or 108 but if the same patient is having ischemic heart disease i will not accept this patient so every case and depending the risk like if it is a major surgery vitreoretinal surgery or oculoplastic surgery where i am expecting very high blood loss so even this a bp of 105 or of diastolic or 160 of systolic is dangerous so below this it will depend case to case then oral hypoglycemics we do continue all oral hypoglycemics just we have to omit the morning dose on the day of the surgery now again like bp what is the acceptable blood sugar ideally not only blood sugar 
HbA1c should also be in normal range. However, many times we will find that this is not possible because HbA1c, if you start to control and make it normal, sometimes it can take even three months. So in that case, if you feel surgery is necessary, we cannot defer surgery for a few months, then at least we have to control blood sugar if it's not an emergency. So blood sugar should be controlled for elective surgeries. Antianginal, all antianginal drugs we have to uh, continue except antiplatelets. Regarding antiplatelets, aspirin. Nowadays, we stop aspirin three days before there, with three exceptions. If patient has recent MI, recent MI means MI within last two months. Recent stroke means stroke uh, in last nine months or if the patient is already on some coronary stent. Ex it, beyond these three, uh, you can say indications, nowadays we do stop aspirin three days before. Clopidogrel before also, we were stopping five days before, and nowadays also we are stopping five days before. Aspirin is a major change. Previously, you know, we were continuing aspirin. In fact, few years back, we were stopping aspirin seven days back, then 72 hours, then we continue and again, they say it should be stopped three days before. However, if the patient is posted for cataract surgery, they say you can continue antiplatelets because we don't expect any significant bleeding in cataract surgery. So it can be continued. Anticoagulants, warfarin, you know, we stopped five days before. Newer anticoagulants like Rivoroxaban or Debigatran, so there are different, but you just remember that all these newer or novel antioxidants we stopped two days before. If that is not possible, then we have to go for bridge therapy with low molecular weight heparin. Now, again, like antiplatelets, for cataract surgery, if you feel INR is in a th therapeutic range, not beyond therapeutic range, I'm not saying normal, therapeutic range, and that range, you know, vary from <clears throat> condition to conditions, like this range may be different for Wall prosthesis or different for wall prosthesis done before 1990 or after 1990, similarly different for uh, VTE profile access. So that obviously is a part of cardiologist. They give us what is the therapeutic range. So if INR is in the therapeutic range, they say you can continue even anticoagulants for cataract surgery. And of course, the surgeon has to be comfortable with all this. As far as anesthesia is concerned, majority of the surgeries are possible under regional. And definitely we prefer regional. And regional blocks are given by ophthalmologists themselves. And that Dr. Nia uh, is going to discuss you in detail. And in fact, uh, this Am American Society of Anesthesiologists, they did a very large study where uh, they compared the rate of complications when regional blocks were given by an ophthalmologist or by an anesthetist. And unfortunately, the incidence of complications were significantly higher when they were given by anesthetist. So before that also, and after reading this report also, we actually don't uh, peep even in the OT of the ophthalmologist if they are giving blocks, because even our uh, site may increase their complication rate. So we will only go if they call us for something. Otherwise, we stay outside, prefer, prefer to stay outside, not uh, with the ophthalmologist like Dr. Nea, I think anesthetist would like to work, be with her all the time. Uh, so, uh, so obviously we uh, are uh, we are in IOTs for monitored anesthesia care. So they need us even when they are giving blocks. They want us to be around to handle the complications, and for that obviously we go for monitored anesthesia care. And majority, almost eighty percent of the uh, surgeries are possible with block plus monitor anesthesia care. And we actually monitor anesthesia care means we are just monitoring the vitals and if there is some complications, we manage. Now, this can be done with the sedation, without sedation. We always prefer without sedation. That is best. Why? Because sedation is a 2 s sword. Like, there's a very good saying regarding sedation. If patient is not well sedated, a cooperative patient will become uncooperative. And if patient is too deep sedated, then patient will not be able to cooperate. So it's a two-way sword. If patient is in light sedation, patient can move. And you know that 
movement during surgery can be dangerous can produce any kind of ocular injuries which is very dangerous if patient is too deep then they may go in apnea particularly obese patients or uh, uh, old age people they are over sensitive uh, to medications so if they go in deep sedation and apnea then again become catastrophic so we have to have achieve optimal sedation which is very difficult because there are studies which have shown that sedation difference can vary up to 10 times between different individuals so we don't know so optimal sedation we have to achieve and we have different grades so i will not discuss all those details so generally they say observational grades which are five grades at five means patient is fully conscious and one no not responsive at all so it should be in between 2 to 3 so simply you can say patient should be calm but responsive patient should respond to your commands that should be your level of sedation and this actually uh, dr niya <coughs> must be knowing very well and this actually is a, a topic of controversy between ophthalmologist and anesthetist they say sir sir uh, patient is not deep and if we we can't make him deep also so it becomes really very difficult so it is difficult to achieve that's why i said again that sedate without sedation is the best but yes if not possible we have to go and we have to titrate sedation very slowly now drugs uh, normally we are using midazolam or fentanyl or a combination of both that usually is sufficient if not then we patient may require a little dose of propofol or dexmedetomidine that you know is new alpha 2 agonist low dose ketamine so don't uh, <clears throat> pop up your eyes looking at ketamine for ophthalmology i said low dose so low dose ketamine has been found not to increase intraocular pressure and we are using it routinely in fact so low dose ketamine you can use means only sedative doses not the anesthetic doses so normally in my setup uh, for giving block i am using triple combination that is either a small dose of ketamine or propofol plus a small dose of midazolam and fentanyl that is for block because block time uh, <clears throat> you need patient to be little deep and as soon as block is done then we maintain either on midazolam fentanyl or both so general anesthesia i told you 80% of the uh, ocular surgeries are possible under uh, regional anesthesia with mac with sedation without sedation remaining 20% surgeries we need to give ga particularly pediatric patients or if there occurs block failure of there is some contraindication for block or patient is too uncooperative or claustrophobic which is again a big issue or patient is uh, in delirium dementia because old age people they may be having cognitive dysfunction now uh, general anesthesia is common like uh, that you all know uh, general anesthesia we will not discuss those details important is what are the anesthetic concerns during general anesthesia for ocular surgeries in specific so you know intubation is one of the strongest sympathetic response of the body and during intubation uh, not only there can occur tachycardia hypertension intraocular pressure can tremendously rise so you have to do everything to block this reflex responses to intubation again i'm not going details of those that we have already discussed that what all we do to avoid this reflex responses to intubation then very important we have to avoid sudden movement particularly if it is a vitreal surgery or cornea transplant then uh, dr niya very well know that movement during vitreal surgeries or cornea transplant can be hazardous then you know that the most common cause of ocular injuries is coughing and bucking particularly during extubation so this you have to do so to prevent all these things most important thing is obviously we have to maintain deep plane of anesthesia in fact they say normally we give muscle relaxant when patient recover spontaneously but during ocular anesthesia they say that it should be done under neuromuscular monitoring because that situation should not come that patient recover spontaneously but uh, practically it is not done neuromuscular monitoring is rarely available but yes ideally uh, your muscle relaxation should be guided by neuromuscular monitoring and very important deep extubation because i told you 
coughing and bucking will be seen at extubation. So patient should be deeply extubated. In fact, you know, whenever there occur hypotension, we generally decrease the depth of anesthesia because deep anesthesia patient can become hypotensive. But ocular surgery, they say you will not decrease the depth of anesthesia even if you have to use the vasopressors to treat hypotension. That's an important thing. Then uh, we have to avoid nitrous oxide if it is a retinal detachment surgeries and ophthalmologists, they are using sulfur hexafluoride or octafluoropropane. And in fact, they say if they have used sulfur hexafluoride, we can't use nitrous oxide for next three weeks. And if they are using octafluoropropane, we can't use nitrous oxide for next two months because it's still, you know that nitrous, ex nitrous oxide can expand the size of this bubble and can significantly increase intraocular pressure. Yes, if they're using silicone oil, then we can safely use nitrous oxide. Then obviously important thing in general anesthesia is that we have to avoid anesthetic agents which increases intraocular pressure and those are ketamine, but I told you in anesthetic doses, low doses we can safely use. Saxamethonium increases intraocular pressure, but a very common problem that we encounter is that patients coming for emergency, ocular trauma, where risk of aspiration is high. So if the risk of aspiration is high, then we will not be bothering about intraocular pressure because life is definitely more important than anything else. And it has been seen that saxamethonium increases intraocular pressure by around 8 to 10. This we can manage by using other agents which decreases intraocular uh, pressure. So if the risk of aspiration is high, we will be using saxamethonium. However, for elective surgeries, definitely saxamethonium will be contraindicated. And even for emergency surgery, if patient is fasting, there's no risk of aspiration, will not be using saxamethonium. Post-operative, a very big misconception is that ocular surgeries are painless or less painful. That's a myth, actually. Ocular surgeries, except cataract. Cataract, okay, it's not uh, much painful. But other ocular surgeries are very painful, particularly your, even your vitreal surgeries or oculoplastic surgeries, they're very painful. So post-operative management is very important, which Dr. Nia must uh, agree with me, which is under-recognized and mismanaged or not managed, I'll say. Yes. So they should be uh, given adequate analgesia, which should be multimodal. And again, we'll not go in those details of multimodal analgesia for post-op period. Yes, we should avoid opioids. And the reason for avoiding opioids is particularly old age, or we are going to discharge patient home because majority of the patients are daycare surgery. So opioids can delay their discharge. The nausea and vomiting should be avoided. Again, very important. Nausea and vomiting can significantly increase intraocular pressure. So post-op surgery finishes, that doesn't mean that will not take care of intraocular pressure. So maintaining nausea and vomiting, or you can say preventing nausea and vomiting is very important for ocular surgeries. And there has been case reports of vasovagal after retinal detachment surgeries, which has led to profound bradycardia, or even there has been case arrest cardiac reports of cardiac arrest also. So immediate post-operative period for retinal detachment is very important. Then uh, just a few points for uh, pediatric uh, <coughs> anesthesia. Many of these uh, pediatric patients, they may be associated with congenital anomaly, anomalies. So they carry additional risk. Then pediatric anesthesia itself carries additional risk, particularly, you know, that pediatric population is very vulnerable for hypoxia. So very important pediatric surgery that I like to discuss is squint surgery, strabismus surgery. And strabismus surgery, oculocardic reflex, which is responsible for number of cardiac arrest. And why it happens, you all know. This happens because of the manipulation of ocular muscles, particularly medial rectus. And it is a trigeminal which carries the efferent, while efferents are through vagus, so which can produce profound bradycardia, conduction blocks, AV blocks, or even can proceed to asystole. Most often, just by relieving the stimulus, uh, this reflex gets treated automatically. If not, then you can give atropine or glycopyrrolate. And in extreme cases, patient may, may require even adrenaline or cardiopulmonary resuscitation. 
Then another reflex during squint surgery is ocular respiratory reflex, which is significant, but it doesn't cause this problem because patient is already under general anesthesia. So we don't recognize it. Otherwise, it also is responsible for severe variety apnea and significant respiratory pauses. But patient already on general anesthesia on mechanical ventilation. So this reflex that will become unimportant. Then post-operative squint surgery, half of the patients, half of these children, they have nausea and vomiting, 50% incidence. So prevention is must. And mostly we are using dexamethasone plus on densetron or may, you can use propofol also. And vasovagal incidence is quite high after squint surgery. Then just uh, one line I like to discuss about laser treatment uh, for retinopathy of prematurity. Prematures are at so high risk of anesthesia that generally, if possible, we avoid surgery up to 60 weeks from the date of conception. So if it is possible, we avoid surgery up to 60 weeks. And after 60 weeks, we consider premature to be at par with the term babies. So risk of complications will be comparatively less. And one particular complication we are bothered about in these patients is bronchopulmonary dysplasia, premature. And for that, many times they will be on NICU intubated. And because of the intubation, they, they, they develop brachial stenosis. So our intubation, extubation become disastrous. And normally we don't extubate them in operation theater. We shift them to NICU or pediatric ICU and monitor them at least for 12 hours. And generally we extubate them there only. Then just uh, one more thing I like to discuss here is ocular complications, not during ocular surgeries, non-ocular surgeries and corneal abrasion, or you can say exposure keratitis is the most common ocular complication after general anesthesia. And the reason you already know, blinking is lost. So best is proper lubrication and covering the eye. Very important because corneal abrasion and exposure keratitis is quite common. So you must have seen during general anesthesia, we lubricate eyes and close the eyes and cover the eyes to avoid this corneal abrasion. Then uh, perioperative vision loss can be because of ischemic optic neuropathy. And this is the most common cause of perioperative vision loss. And this usually happen in prone position. In prone position, I get compressed and circulation of the eye is compromised. Or if the patient is in uh, steep head low, deep Randleberg, so still there can be ocular edema, which can cause ischemic optic neuropathy, particularly if there is associated hypotension. Then central Retinal artery occlusion has been reported. That is because of uh, thrombotic or embolic complications. And for those, all those reasons that we discussed, positions, congestion, thrombosis, embolus can also cause cortical blindness. So I think uh, that should be all about uh, uh, anything else we can discuss later also. So over to Dr. Nia. Dr. Nia, I think now you can cover your regional anesthesia. Thank you so much, sir. Water. I think uh, that was a very, very awesome and excellent presentation. And uh, uh, surely students will benefit from your session. But I also got to, you know, revisit those things and uh, remember that, yes, these things uh, do happen. And many a times we do also get this problem that sugar control is not there. And the patient is hell bound because he's having dense cataract. Then which, uh, patient may be having so many drugs, which drugs to, uh, we have to tell them to stop. And then, yes, there are so many things uh, in the eye. We have got so many eye complications, even during the general anesthesia. So uh, though we are, as you <laughs> rightly said, we are not too much dependent on anesthesis. And uh, whenever, you know, students ask me, because uh, recently also when I was taking the interviews of the students who have um, come up with the flying colors in INICT, they were like, ma'am, uh, merits of ophthalmology. So the first thing I say that we are self-dependent. Like we are not dependent on radiologists. We are not dependent on anesthesis because I think the biggest problem for being a surgeon is that you are dependent on these two people and you cannot start your surgery <laughs> before they come but uh, in that respect uh, we are fortunate that we are not that much dependent but obviously we do require 
anesthesist and uh, we do require general anesthesia every time we are performing the surgery on the children and uh, the other people we are having so many of the 30% of the population uh, cannot be operated in the regional anesthesia not so cooperative patient we have got so we do require so uh, thank you so much sir My screen is visible now, Rinsi. Yes, ma'am. All right. So after being covering this uh, general anesthesia uh, so extensively, let's come to the local anesthesia. Uh, here you are actually producing the reversible block to the transmission by you are blocking the uh, peripheral nerve impulses. So yes, we have a lot of advantages and that is why mostly the surgeries in ophthalmology we are doing under local anesthesia. A patient is conscious and alert and I think this is very well required because at times when we are doing the surgery, we are instructing the patient. Plus patient is not that apprehensive as Sir rightly mentioned, you know, whenever general anesthesia is being given the sight of the anesthesist being, you know, standing uh, their side, we have white, uh, you know, coat hypertension. Many a times we have hypertensive people and uh, their BP is well controlled, but they reach the OT, they see the anesthesist, BP again rises, LCD postponed, so they, that is there. I do not know uh, why it is there, but there is a lot of apprehensions when anesthesis is present in the OT. So we do prefer giving the local anesthesia. Patient is also, you know, having that mindset that I am being operated in just the local anesthesia, uh, behoshi nahi deni hai, and uh, that gives them a soothing, uh, you know, uh, response that their surgery is a smaller one. So we have a conscious patient, an alert patient. We can give instructions to the patient also. He can listen to us. Maybe sometimes that is not a very good thing. But yes, uh, the patient is most of the time cooperating with us. Then secondly, the drugs of the general anesthesia can be avoided. As Sir uh, mentioned, so many side effects are there. So many drugs have to be avoided. They are causing the complications. So we can avoid all these drugs uh, under the local anesthesia. And the systemic complications, as uh, Sir rightly mentioned, we have post-operative confusion, the nausea, vomiting. See, every time anything that increases the intra-abdominal pressure, we do not require in ophthalmology and uh, we have to omit those things. So whether it is, you know, you uh, this nausea, vomiting, or it could be coughing, it could be constipation, it could be straining, lifting heavy weights, every kind of thing that can increase the strain, that can increase the intra-abdominal pressure, have to be avoided. We have urinary retention also. And obviously, stress response is pretty high in the cardiac patients. Yes, now we have disadvantages also. So what were the advantages of the general anesthesia will be your disadvantages of the local anesthesia. It is painful and at times the patient is not able to bear the pain and we may have to convert it into general anesthesia. And obviously it's difficult in the uncooperative patient. Sometimes, uh, you know, patients may be having bronchial asthma, patient may be having scoliosis, they are not able to lie that long. Uh, it could be a children. So in those cases, yes, we have to go for the general anesthesia. Then it's not suitable for, it's not suitable for the young patients, mentally challenging uh, patients, unstable patients, or as I told you, the physical disabilities due to which the, uh, the patient is not able to lie because though it's a small period surgery, but obviously we do require the cooperation of the patient and we do require some time, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, we do require uneven fulls in order to do our job. So that period is also required, okay? 
So what are the desired properties of a local anesthesia? I think this is again a very important um, era where you can get a question, like you get the desired properties of the contraceptives. That is an important question. Similarly, here the desired properties of the local anesthesia. So it should be non-irritating, safe and painless. Obviously, irritation of any kind is not required because you require that area to be very, very clean and clear because you have to operate there. Safety is the primary concern and pain is the first thing for which we are doing the anesthesia. So it should be painless. Then it should be water soluble. Onset should be rapid. There is no use uh, waiting for 30 minutes for a 15 minute surgery. So obviously I require rapid onset of action, but duration of action should be stable. If my surgery is for 30 minutes and I am getting the duration of this anesthesia only for 15 minutes, whole idea becomes, uh, you know, a loss. So it, it is very much required that though I require rapid onset, but duration should be stable and also see that uh, what surgery you are going to uh, do and uh, what time approximately it will take so that there is no mismatch. Uh, it should not be there that uh, surgery is for 30 minutes and after 20 minutes, patient starts feeling pain. So that is the biggest trauma. Then it should be non-toxic and obviously the after complications, after it effects should be minimum. It should be effective regardless of its application to which tissue it is being applied to which mucous membrane and then obviously quickly blocking the motor as well as sensory nerve so that its effect, it is very, very efficient. Now, how these local anesthetics are usually working? They are working by creating this ionized um, form. And uh, uh, this ionized uh, form is actually binding with the protein of the sodium channels. So then they are blocking the voltage dependent sodium conductance. This is all your physiology and then this is blocking the depolarization and you know that is the reason why the initiation as well as the propagation of action potential fails, impulses will not be able to go to the higher centers and no pain. So I think a wonderful uh, thing which can uh, stop the pain. If uh, uh, anesthesia is not obviously surgery is not So to be a good surgeon, you require an anesthetist. And to do a good surgery, you require a good anesthesia. That is a basic prerequisite. Now going for the patient preparation. Patient preparation is almost similar for the general anesthesia. You require an optimal health condition. As, as Sir also said that, pre-patient uh, uh, preparation, that is a prerequisite and that should be done exactly similar to the general anesthesia because you never know that which patient has to be, you know, taken, had, it has to be converted for general anesthesia. So, uh, though, uh, honestly speaking, we do not take this uh, in every patient and we are not taking, uh, you know, due care that every patient will have to be converted into general anesthesia. But yes, we are not doing the surgeries unless the person in is in his or her optimal conditions. Then a friendly repo, that is very much required. A person has come to you with a confidence that you are going to do a surgery for his or her well-being. So that, you know, a doctor-patient relationship is obviously very much required. Then a suitable vein because you have to give the local anesthesia. And even though we are doing it for the local anesthesia, be prepared uh, for the CPR. So equipment should always be there. Prepare for the worst always, you know, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. So always get ready for the cardiopulmonary resuscitation and now monitoring. And for this, we always require the anesthesis and uh, a good ophthalmologist always do uh, take care that a anesthetist should be there in the vicinity. So when you are in the medical colleges or you are in the corporate hospitals, you have a good team working and you have that advantage of any time you require anesthetist will be there. But even if you are doing a private setup, I think that's a good idea that keep anesthetist in the vicinity or on call so that anytime you may require his help, he may come, right? Now, toxicity of the local anesthetics, uh, even though we have lesser toxicity, lesser side effects of the local anesthesia, but still they are there. Uh, lightheadedness, we have uh, numbness, we have got tingling, anxiety because patient is not, you know, completely unknown. Uh, he knows about all these things. And though pain sensation goes, that sensations are there. So anxiety, drowsiness, the tinnitus, that is there. Sometimes they are not very common convulsions and coma, even apnea or the cardiovascular collapse can be there. But obviously they are not that common and that is why we are 
going ahead with the local anesthesia. Now, uh, if you go to the chemical structure, uh, these local anesthetics are of two types. One is your ester groups and one is your amide groups. And ester groups are known to cause more allergies. So again, uh, before you go for the surgeries, please take proper history of any allergy in the patient. I think that is a very, very basic aspect of anything. Whenever you take, uh, any, uh, take up any patient for the surgery, take a proper history, any drug history, any history of allergy any previous history of surgeries all these things have to be taken care of it is not left that you got a patient and you got him for the surgery please take proper history and examination that is very very much important not only for your academics but also for your clinics so any allergic history should be noted there commonly used local anesthetics are your of um, oxybuprocaine we have got lignocaine and bupivacaine now, uh, for your practical purpose, mostly what we are using is the lignocaine plus bupivacaine. Um, onset of action, duration of action, concentrations are different. And uh, I will be telling you the concentrations that we will be using in the cataract surgery. Uh, if you uh, know already or if you want, then you can remember this. Otherwise, you can just remember the concentration that we are using for the cataract surgery, right? Uh, then we also have the proparacaine, amethocaine, ropivacaine. So we have got different drugs. Now coming towards the advantages and disadvantages of topical anesthesia. Now one good thing is that uh, the surgeries in ophthalmology nowadays they are becoming like daycare surgeries. So we are having this advantage that even under the uh, topical anesthesia we are doing the surgery that is cost effective also giving immediate visual recovery and patients are happy because uh, after some time they are all free you know they are not even coming for a night stay they are coming uh, undergoing all the evaluation they are going back to their home they are sleeping at their home then in the morning they are coming surgery is done in just 15 20 minutes and then again they are back at home so uh, i think the anxiety and apprehension is very very less in those cases and we do not have the complications that we are having with the retrobulbar blocks and all the globe rupture, the nerve damage. So we are avoiding that also. But yes, there are disadvantages, no akinesia. So we have anesthesia, but akinesia is not there. So those surgeries which require the akinesia, those surgeries which are uh, having the extended duration, or uh, we have well-informed and motivation, uh, motivational patient is required because patient is listening everything. So you have to take a proper informed consent. Though we take the informed consent in every case, but here you have to explain everything because patient is listening everything. Then where you have to motivate this patient. Many a times the patients are not well motivated. So they will be giving consent uh, before, but when you start with the surgery and uh, then their level of apprehension becomes high and they may be, you know, uh, uh, getting up so you have to convince the patient you have to tell the patient you have to reassure the patient you have to tell them that this much of time will take uh, please you know get come with a mindset then even we have to explain them uh, their relatives also or the family members because most of the time you know our population our um, uh, patients are usually you know extremes of the age so both are children either it's very uh, young age or very elderly age and it's said that both are same so you have to take into consideration their age also. Uh, the adverse effect of topical anesthesia, yes, we have a lot of toxicity both to the epithelium and the endothelium. The chances of allergies are high, especially with the ester group. Alteration of the lacrimation, uh, watering pattern can be altered. And obviously the surface keratopathy, because whatever you are using, you are using over the cornea. So surface keratopathy is pretty, pretty high, right? Uh, coming to the uses of topical anesthesia, now mainly uh, where we are using this topical anesthesia for the superficial cornea or for the conjunctiva. So when I am doing the surgeries just on the superficial layers of the cornea or over the conjunctiva, even in the phaco emulsification, I think this is a boon to the ophthalmology uh, world where you are doing the phaco emulsification. Of course, the patient has to be cooperative, but if a patient is cooperative, we can do the phaco emulsification even with this topical anesthesia. And then you can also use as a you know supplement. Before the regional blocks, I can also use topical anesthesia and I can extend the duration. So that is also one of the indications. 
Now, first, the most popular one, the Perry bulbar blocks. I think um, if you people have, uh, I do not talk the last year because pandemic. Hai. Otherwise, uh, whenever you uh, people get to go into the OT, though we do not entertain much uh, of the UG students inside the Optal OT, uh, <clears throat> this is one OT where we cannot, you know, tolerate the asepsis. So, um, but the videos have been shown to the students or if you are privileged enough to have visited the Phaloti, you must have seen these peribulbar blocks. Uh, why they are called as peribulbar blocks? Because we are injecting it into peribulbar space. From this peribulbar space, see what is this peribulbar space? Can you see? This is your orbit here. This is the eyeball. So, peribulbar means in the periphery of the ball. Ball uh, means, means eyeball. So this, uh, these are your peri-bulbar um, spaces. This is the superior peri-bulbar space and this is your inferior peri-bulbar space, okay? So from there, it's going to the lid and as well as other spaces and that is why it is producing both a kinesia as well as anesthesia and that is why it is the most popular block that we are using nowadays. Uh, the agents, uh, if you remember, I told you, mostly we are using the lignocaine and bupivacaine. So these concentrations you have to uh, know actually. 2% lignocaine and 0.75% bupivacaine we are using. And along with this, for the better penetration, we are also using the hydronidase and adrenaline, right? Now, the volume. Look at the volume. Volume is 8 to 10 ml. Now, they are saying approximately 8 to 10 ml, but practically we are using 10 ml. 5 ml in the upper peribulbar space and 5 ml in the lower space. Now, always remember L for L. Matlab, we have to give one above and one lower. So, lower lid may L, it is towards the lateral side. And in the upper eyelid, it is towards the medial side. So, in the upper one, we are giving at the junction of what? It is the medial one third and lateral two thirds. So, it is towards the medial side. Well, L for L. Matlab, lower lid may, it is towards the lateral side, medial two third and lateral one third. And uh, if you look the position of the patient, it is always the supine position because you are all set for the surgery also. You are going to do the surgery in the supine position and patient should be looking in the primary gaze like this. Okay, it is not this or this because you have to attain the akinasia. So it is very, very important that the patient is just looking in the primary gaze. So afterwards, you are not having any problem in giving the incision. Um, looking at uh, the, uh, this see how we are going to give this. So you are going to use the two different injections, 5 ml and 5 ml, and you are just giving uh, parallelly. So this is a, a very good block and you are getting the extended results also. Most of the intraocular surgeries are being performed in this peribulbar block, a very good one. Position I have told you, so uses, you can see most of the uh, intraocular surgeries, beta cataract, the glaucoma, even the keratoplasties. Uh, as sir told, the corneal transplantations, many a times it requires the general anesthesia. It is a longer one, but even we are doing the keratoplasties with this peribulbar block. Even vitreoretinal surgeries, uh, vitreoretinal surgeries are usually the longer surgeries, but even those are being done with the peribulbar block and the squint surgeries too. The advantages, advantages are that a retrobulbar block that is now being obsolete almost, I will be talking about that also, that was having a lot of chances of globe injury and optic nerve damage because that we were giving in the uh, posterior area. The posterior area means uh, at the apex of the orbit uh, we used to give. But here we have this advantage, we do not have these chances of uh, globe injury because you are right away in the peribulbar space, you are not going towards the cone at the orbital apex. So you do not have that uh, chances of optic nerve damage, but yes, everything comes with a price. Uh, disadvantage is that uh, we have pain, means even you are getting the pain on this peribulbar block. Uh, conjunctival chemosis, where you are injecting, can you see? We have got ballooning of this conjunctiva. And uh, surely it is giving you lesser akinasia in comparison to the retrobulbar block. But because advantages are much more, we are forgetting these disadvantages and we are going with this peribulbar blocks. Uh, now coming to the retrobulbar blocks. Now, what is happening uh, in the retrobulbar blocks? This is actually injected in the muscle cone. Now, what is this muscle cone? Can you see this? This is the eyeball here. And we have put the different muscles here. So this is inside one is your muscle cone. 
so basically we are <coughs> giving this block inside this muscle cone which is very near to the apex of the orbit and i think you will remember that at the apex of the orbit we have got this annulus of zin the common tendinous ring called as annulus of zin from this uh, annulus of zin all these muscles are coming and they are inserting in the sclera and also we have this optic nerve so basically you are in the intraorbital space so whenever you are in this intraorbital space uh, all the extraocular muscles are also prone to trauma optic nerve is also prone to trauma so we have that problem this uh, is giving the uh, anesthesia to the ciliary nerve and ganglion also then also to the third nerve and sixth nerve so you have to remember it is not giving to the fourth nerve so superior oblique is not being actually uh, anesthetized why because it is outside the muscle cone and this is being given inside the muscle cone position will be same same supine position primary gaze and here you are giving a single injection there you were giving two injections 5 ml and 5 ml both in the peribulbar space one in the superior peribulbar space and you were going just parallelly like this and parallelly like this but here the uh, position is quite different can you see there are two needles here so if you see here this is your position number 1 and this is your position number 2 first you have to be uh in the lower eyelid and whenever you are at lower eyelid you have to be towards the lateral side means at the junction of medial two third lateral one third and you are going parallelly just like this now afterwards you have to tilt your needle how much you have to tilt your needle you have to go backward upward and medially so the second time when you are going first time it was like this then you have to tilt it it is backward then upward and you are going medially when you are going medially you are just going towards the apex of the orbit can you see this it is just going towards the apex this is the apex of the orbit so though we have to use a very smaller quantity here it is just 2 to 4 ml but obviously because it is going towards the apex of the orbit there are high chances of hemorrhage the optic nerve damage all these things are quite quite possible but the advantages are we are getting better echinacea then we are getting dilatation of pupil and at times this disadvantage that it is causing the dilatation of the pupil is advantages you require dilatation of the pupil in cataract surgery so in that respect it's good it is having a uh, adequate anesthesia more amount of anesthesia quicker anesthesia it's less painful then lesser amount of uh, local anesthetic is required so obviously lesser chances of toxicity but uh, you will say that if there are so many advantages then why it is obsolete why we are not doing retrobulbar blocks so yes there are complications so many complications with the retrobulbar blocks we have got hemorrhages as i told you more chances of glow perforation then we have optic nerve damage optic atrophy and obviously if there is optic nerve damage there will be chances of decreased visual acuity and a very important thing is the retinal vascular occlusion so i cannot actually use a block to in my patient who has come up for the cataract surgery just for the visual improvement and he is having the risk of retrobulbar hemorrhage optic nerve damage optic sheath injury optic atrophy which will again reduce the visual acuity which will be irreversible and also the crdo so that is why it's not done and it's obsolete then we have got other things like brain stem echinacea there could be convulsions extraocular muscle palsy because it is going towards the orbital apex apex pe we have got all the extraocular muscles then trigeminal nerve blocks ocular cardiac reflex and respiratory arrest i'll be talking about this in detail in due course all right then there are certain contraindications which can again be asked as a direct mcq now don't think that retrobulbar block is obsolete so they cannot ask you a question on retrobulbar block they can very well ask right so uh, the contraindications are the bleeding disorders obviously because we have a risk of retrobulbar hemorrhage so if a patient is always uh, already having some bleeding diastasis some bleeding disorders so it is contraindicated then glow perforation so don't do it in extreme myopia anything which is leading to overstretching of the eyeball so you have to avoid this in the patients of high myopia then open eye injury if there is a open eye injury there could be expulsion of the intraocular content so don't do retrobulbar block and uh, then obviously the posterior stephyloma which is again a feature of high myopia so don't do it because already it is so much stress so chances of growth perforation are very very high 
Now a parabulbar block, which is also called as a subtenon block. Now this is uh, being given with the help of a lignocaine. We have to just give a small conjunctival in, uh, uh, incision and a blunt cannula. The thing is that because you are using it, you know, in the subtenon space, you have to use a blunt needle here, and uh, we have to insert it to the posterior subtenon space. And uh, just, you know, a uh, kind of bathing is done, uh, the nerves and muscles within this cone we have to do. Um, for the conjunctival surgeries, this is very, very good. This is uh, the thing what we are doing. And uh, it has so many advantages because when you are doing this, you are avoiding any vascular injury, any optic nerve injury, the volume of the anesthetics that is required. And it's a, a very good way of giving the anesthesia more towards the anterior segment. So when you require more of anesthesia in the iris, in the anterior segment, you can opt for this. But certainly everything comes with a price. So disadvantages, subconjunctival hemorrhage, because you are giving it in the conjunctival area. So there we can have hemorrhage. And obviously the post-operative morbidity is higher. Then there is another block called as a frontal block. Frontal block, it is a, you know, very definite kind of block, not the generalized one. Whenever you want to block the supraorbital or supratrochlear nerve. So basically upper eyelid surgery, we can opt for this. And uh, at your level, the upper eyelid surgery means basically the tosis surgery. So frontal block can be an option when we are going for the tosis surgery. What you are doing to just below the midpoint of the supraorbital margin. And you have to go directing towards the roof of the orbit. So good thing is that here you are going towards the roof of the orbit and not the apex of the orbit. So we are avoiding all those complications. Volume is again very less, 2 ml. So for all the tosis surgeries, I think this is a very good option. Then there is an intracameral surgery. Now this I uh, really wanted to talk about. This is a very um, innovative idea. And intracameral anesthesia we are even using for the PACO emulsification in addition to the topical anesthesia. So this is a very promising new technique where we are using the ocular lidocaine. So what we are doing here, the anesthetics, we are placing near the nerve tissue. So when you are placing it near the nerve tissue, it will penetrate the nerve sheet. It will block, as I told you before also, the initiation of the action potential. And uh, that is why impulses are being stopped. Now, what is the use? What is the use? Whenever you do not, uh, you know, um, uh, know about the ideal time, the placement, it's not determined, then you can use it. Then you can also use it in those patients. Suppose you give the topical anesthesia and you are feeling that it's not adequate. Then quickly you can go, go for the intracameral anesthesia also. And then in order to supplement certain blocks, like the subconjunctival block that we were talking about or the parabulbar block, like the subtenons block, so for the small procedures, you can use them or uh, for the incremental pain, you need to increase or for beforehand also for supplementing certain blocks, you can use them. What drug we are going to use? Uh, we have, what is this PF actually? It is preservative free. You have to use a preservative free drugs here. Lidocaine also we can use, bupivacaine we can use. Lidocaine 1%, bupivacaine 0.5%. Now, what is the dosage? Dosage is very, very small. It's just, it is just 0.1 to 0.5 ml into the anterior chamber. And as I told you, even before the phaco emulsification, we are using. So let me show you the diagram. Also see this. Uh, I know everybody knows about the intravitreal injection. We always talk about it in the diabetic retinopathy also. So when you are giving in this vitreous cavity, it is the intravitreal injection. But when you are giving in this anterior chamber, chamber say you word banana intracameral, then it is called as the intracameral injection. I think this diagram will tell you exactly where we are giving the injection. But uh, however, this also is having these side effects. So uh, these drugs are not formulated for the intraocular uh, usage and you are using it intraocularly. So obviously efficacy and safety is not known. And that is the reason it is not approved by the FDA till now. So <coughs> though I have, <coughs> sorry, I have talked about this intracameral anesthesia in great details and we are giving it. But side by side, I will also tell you that this has not been approved by FDA till now, right? Uh, then coming to the next one, uh, this is your facial blocks. 
uh, facial blocks now which muscle uh, as i always ask you in the class also which muscle of the eye is actually supplied by the facial nerve that is your orbicularis oculi right so obviously when i want to block this orbicularis oculi i can use this facial blocks and uh, they can also be used as an adjuvant to the retrobulbar block now if you remember i told you in the beginning van uh, van lent was there so we have got different kind of blocks because we have got different branches of the facial nerve so for for the terminal branches we have got van lent please type the terminal names of the terminal branches in the comment section let me see how many of you remember the terminal branches when you are going for the proximal trunk near the condylar process and o'brien then we have got the um, the uh, the facial nerve coming out of the stylomastoid foramen then it is called as the uh, nadbat and the rahman block and then atkinson for the superior branches so we have got different kind of block let me show you the images also see um, this is your van lens block van lens block is for your uh, peripheral branches also called as terminal branches hum log is tarah se yaad karte the the temporal zygomatic buccal mandibular and cervical and uh, how much solution you are giving 2.5 ml of the solution can you see this is the uh, site where i am giving this van lens block uh, it is 2 cm behind the lateral orbital margin so you have to go in level with this outer canthus this is your van lens block uh, while the other one is the o'brien's block so o'brien block is near the condylar process so how will you get to know it is about 1 cm anterior to the tragus now how will you know the condylar process you can uh, you know go 1 cm anterior to the tragus just palpate it ask the patient to open and close the mouth you will get to know this and uh, that is how we get to know and there you have to give 4 to 6 4 to 6 ml of the uh, local anesthetic this is your obrans block we are using right so this was about uh, the facial block now coming to the complications i told you we'll be talking about the complications so uh, let's talk about the retrobulbar hemorrhage so uh, how do you get to know that there is a retrobulbar hemorrhage what are the warning signs and symptoms because you know um, our consultants used to say that a good surgeon is the one who not only avoids the complications you who also knows how to deal with the complications because every time you are doing the surgery you cannot be 100% sure that uh, there will be no complication and there is no surgery without complication so uh, just uh, just don't prepare yourself for a complication less surgery also prepare yourself for the complications that is very very important uh, so uh, there will be rapid you know um, increase in the intraorbital and intraocular pressure elevation and obviously there will be because hemorrhage blood is accumulating behind so you will have proptosis and whenever we have accumulation of blood there will be pain ecchymosis there will be chemosis there will be congestion and obviously vision will go down so whenever you are having all this kind of a picture while you are doing the surgery you should have a alarming button there right so how will you manage um first of all we have to evaluate quickly to the indirect ophthalmoscopy and look for the central retinal artery because we are also worried about the central retinal arteriolar occlusion and uh, treatment you already know of the CRAO you have to give the acetazolamide mannitol ocular massage paracentesis carbol mixture inhalation so you know that right um then we can also go for the surgical decompression if the medical management is not helping it could be canthotomy cantholysis orbital decompression i'm not going into the detail because that will go slightly up that is of the pg scope but uh, you should know the alarming signs and symptoms of retrobulbar hemorrhage and the complications yes then we have the uh, globe perforation so what are the things that uh, we are suspecting for the globe perforation obviously perforation will be a painful condition so we will have marked pain hypotony because uh, if there is a perforation whole of the fluids will be coming out so now there will be hypotony in the hemorrhage there was a raised intraocular pressure here i am having hypotony then simultaneously there, there can be vitreous hemorrhage whenever there is a globe perforation it is coming out with a boom so there can also be associated vitreous hemorrhage due to vitreous hemorrhage there will be absence of the red glow and vitreous hemorrhage will also lead to the sight threatening complications right then obviously you have to seek the help of a vitreo retinal surgeon then we can have optic nerve injury optic atrophy uh, there could be a direct trauma by the needle we can have a ischemic damage or sometimes what is happening there is a hemorrhage 
due to the retrobulbar uh, blocks so that hemorrhage is actually compressing so we have a compressive optic neuropathy that could also be there and there can also be a compression from the local anesthesia that you are giving or sometimes what we are doing after the local anesthesia the pressure that we are giving to the eye the ocular massage that we are doing maybe it is very very you know strenuous so if you have given extensive massaging after that that can also lead to the optic nerve compression so uh, need to care avoid very very deep injections into the orbital cavity these are certain you know careful things that you have to see and injecting the eye as i told you the patient should be in the primary position that is the uh, best position for giving anesthesia patient should be supine along with the primary gaze talking about the brain stem anesthesia this is actually the anesthesia when there is a local spread of the anesthetic along the optic nerve sheath so we come to know that um, because it's it has gone along the optic nerve sheath this patient can be coming with the light headedness drowsiness there will be confusion uh, loss of contact that is why it is called as brain stem anesthesia even the cranial nerve palsies convulsions respiratory arrest cardiac arrest and it's very very quick you know within 10 to 20 minutes of local anesthesia it starts but it remains for a very long time hours ke liye it remains so again a uh, you know uh, tough word a severe complication and uh, then muscle palsies because in the retrobulbar blocks you are going towards the orbital apex you are uh, injecting near the muscle cone so extraocular muscles can be involved that is why you know we can have diplopia we can have ptosis and uh, i think a very very important thing is the ocular cardiac reflex which many of the students have also asked me many times what is this ocular cardiac reflex and what is the relationship between the heart and the eye so a uh, good way of remembering it that it is a trigeminal vagal reflex so eye ki fifth nerve hai and heart ka vagal there is a communication so afferent is a trigeminal nerve and efferent is a vagal one so whenever we are putting extra pressure on the extraocular muscle you are putting the pressure on the globe then due to this reflex i will tell you the pathway also we are having the bradycardia as sir also told you bradycardia ventricular ectopia or fibrillation so what is the pathway pathway is that it is actually passing through the long and short ciliary nerves so from the ciliary nerves it will go to the ciliary ganglion from the ciliary ganglion it will go to the afferent nerve that is your trigeminal ganglion and from this trigeminal ganglion where where you have a nucleus located in the floor of the fourth ventricle it is going through the vasovagal center of that is located in the medulla to the vagus nerve and obviously vagus will act on the heart that is why we are having bradycardia so uh, cardio uh, the ocular cardiac reflex the other name is again very important remember it trigeminal vagal reflex and uh, this is the pathway this is how we get the bradycardia right in the, especially in the squint surgeries so what is the treatment stop the surgical stimulus sometimes you know you have to give the treatment sometimes even removing the stimulus will work give adequate ventilation to the patient and ensure that there is a sufficient uh, anesthetic depth also patient may not be having a termination of the anesthesia then you can use the anticholinergics uh, immediately or you may have used it before also so what are your take home messages take home messages you have to remember that all the local anesthetics are myotoxic so uh, whenever we are doing the surgeries you know we are using this local anesthetics so there are certain things that have to be kept in mind Uh, so myotoxicity is one thing that you always have to remember and therefore the direct injection into the muscle have to be avoided because we do have to take special care about our extraocular muscles then no local anesthetic technique is entirely free of systemic side effects so be ready and also tell your patient take an informed consent and tell your patient that you will certainly have some side effects then the needle that you are using again should be very short and fine okay because the depth of penetration is again very important then the patient's position it should be supine and in the primary gaze that is again very very important gentle aspiration then when you are inserting the needle aspirate gently so that you could know the contents and blood should not be there 
then bevel of the needle facing the globe and tangential to the sclera that is again very very important otherwise you may go uh, behind the globe you may go into the orbital apex you may go into the uh, extraocular muscles you may end up in the optic nerve injury and all ocular surgeries with la should be treated as the general anesthesia as the sir rightly mentioned that um, every time you are giving the local anesthesia uh, uh, take it as a general anesthesia or be prepared that you may have to convert it into general anesthesia give that uh, you know counseling to the patient so that they have that in their back of the mind so that even if you have to convert it Uh, in the middle of the surgery they, you do not have to ponder much to take their consent because obviously you have to take the consent again also uh, those things are again very very important i think um, this is the most important take home message and uh, i think uh, this is all sir uh, would you like to say something no that's really fine uh, presentation from you dr niya it actually covered almost everything i feel so that was really nice and it was a really nice endeavor from your side to arrange this integrated session thank you so much sir and um, thank you all the students for your patience i hope these integrated sessions will help you and uh, waiting for your feedback and also the topics that you would like us to integrate in the future uh, please uh, do write to me in the comment section or you can directly message me thank you so much sir for taking out time and giving uh, the excellent piece of advice on the general anesthesia and uh, we hope that in future again we will be meeting in the integrated sessions we'll be doing more and more integrated sessions sir Thank you. Sure, sure, Doctor. Thank you very much. And th